the Toyota Land Cruiser not luxurious enough for you, maybe you need one of these bad boys. This is the Lexus LX, based on the same TNGA F platform as the 300 series Land Cruiser, and some of the powertrain certainly carries across in some models. In Australia, you can get the LX with a 3.3 litre turbo diesel V6, which is called the LX 500D, or this model, which is the LX 600, featuring a 3.3 litre, it's actually a 3.4 litre, twin turbo V6 petrol engine. This engine is not available in the Land Cruiser in Australia. I'm not sure about overseas, but in Australia, this engine is not available in the Land Cruiser. It's a beast of a thing, 305 kilowatts and 650 newton meters, more than enough to push this almost 2.6 ton beast along the road with decent acceleration. I'll do a zero to 100 run for you a bit later on. We already know that it does about 6.4 seconds. I've timed it on my previous channel, P Drive TV in 6.38 I think it was but we'll do a test again today just to see it's actually got 20,000 kilometers on it this press car which is quite high for a press car but I'm interested to see if the performance has changed at all because I think when I tested it originally it was pretty low kilometers and the engine is probably not fully worn in uh, whereas now it certainly is anyway this is not about acceleration this is about pure country conquering capability and it's huge this is the sports luxury variant, which is five seat only in Australia, but you can get a seven seat option in the lower end specification or the trim level called the luxury. The sports luxury comes with these twin 11.6 inch touchscreen or multimedia systems. You can do various things through this multimedia screen, including operate the radio and so on, but that does play through the speakers at the front as well. And then you do have mirror cast and HDMI connection options. Down below here we've got a full suite of climate controls, seat heating and seat cooling and you've also got access to the little cool box or fridge that's in the middle here, you turn it on and off there and it just runs through the air conditioning system. It does keep drinks cool, I've actually tried it and you can put a, you know, a warm can of drink in there and within you know an hour or two it's actually a cold drink these rear seats do recline and you've got plenty of leg room but like with the 300 series land cruiser and even the 200 series the floor is surprisingly high so i'm not very tall and you can probably see my under the side of my legs it's it's not dropping down enough to to cause that to touch the seat i've actually got my knees raised up just a little bit you might think when you get in these big things that uh yeah you've got a lot more sort of leg dangling room but yeah, the floor is quite high and that's to maximize off-road capability, obviously. But just something to keep in mind. If you're really tall, you will start to raise your knees a little bit as you're sitting here. You've also got an awesome Mark Levinson stereo, cool speaker grills, pop-up blinds for the rear windows. And being the five-seat model means you've got maximum boot space. There is over 1,100 litres available there, and if you pop down those rear seats and they fully fold away and up, you've got almost 2,000 litres. You've also got a socket on the, on the wall here, 220 volt, 100 watt Australian household socket. You've got options here to pop down the rear seats. You do have evidence of the, that this is a seven seater originally, or seven seat capable, with the vents and the cup holders along the back there. And then under the floor, we've just got a little bit of storage for some of the repair accessories and so on. I do actually like the five seat option. Unless you really need seven seats, this is better for touring in my opinion. I remember taking the previous gen LX 450D right up to far north Queensland with my one year old son at the time and my wife. And we loved that it was just five seats because we could fit everything in here, the pram and everything. Whereas with the seven seat option, you've just got the obstacle of you know, having to store that third row. Um, and then without it, yeah, you've just maximized the boot space. And in the front, you've got multiple touch screens with lots of stuff going on. It actually takes you a little bit of time just to take everything in and recognize where things are located. You've got a general spewing of <laughs> different functions all over the place. So on this side, you've got the drive mode select. Um, and you can go through like sports mode and all that sort of thing. 
And then on the other side, you've got the dual range transfer case, so low range. And then you've got some driving options down below here and then directly above all the climate controls. This touch screen is a little bit confusing in my opinion because it's kind of got the climate at the moment, but then it's got this G-force meter thing and your brake acceler accelerometer kind of set up going on within the climate settings, which is a bit confusing. And then you push the climate settings and it gives you even more climate settings. Um, and then you've got just a general settings button as well. I think they could have done a bit better with that. It's just a little bit confusing. I'm sure once you've driven it for a while and live with it for a while, you do get used to it like all things. But yeah, I think they could have done a bit better with that. Also with this touch screen up above here, I've got Apple CarPlay going at the moment. So you've got the very common grid layout of apps, which is pretty much shared in any car that has Apple CarPlay. But if we go into the Lexus system, I think that's pretty poor effort as well, because like, look at all that blank space and a lot of the options even that, it's just all this blank space. Um, the settings bar here, like what's going on here? Obviously when you do click on things, it does jump over to this side, but it just seems like that could have been done a lot better. Um, just the menu flow as well. So you go into the general settings and you go over here, and then you can kind of go through and it's kind of to the left. It's, I don't know, to me, it just doesn't quite make sense. It's not completely intuitive again. You'll probably get used to it after living with it for a while, um, but just on first impressions, I think they could have done a bit better with that. Lexus hasn't been sort of the leader in that sort of technology, in my opinion. They always try very hard, but um, I think they miss the mark. It's, I'm glad they got rid of the touchpad down here to control the screen. So that was a very advanced technology kind of effort where they wanted to show off what they could do, but in the real world, it just wasn't very practical in my opinion anyway and it, it looks like that you know that's that's a pretty valid opinion because they've they've since removed that i do like that there are lots of buttons around so seat heating and, and everything both sides uh, are down there and you've got your handbrake and all that sort of thing center diff lock and then you can raise and lower the vehicle with the adjustable suspension there. I like having the option to just click a button to access some of that stuff rather than dive into that touch screen, especially if it had that menu system, it would just be a not, bit of a nightmare to access the various functions. You may have noticed there is a big wireless phone charger here, but it's, it's quite big and it's, it's kind of rubber lined, but your phone slides around a lot. And I find that it doesn't take many corners and your phone sort of disconnects the, the, the charging uh, function it'd be better if that was just I don't know had some sort of cradle or just something that holds your phone a bit more securely and then you've got Lexus's latest uh, they've ha actually had this for a, a while but yeah on this side you've got the navigation for the, um, the the instrument cluster there so you can go through the different options and so on and on this side you've got all your cruise control functions and your lane keep assist all right, we'll go for a bit of a drive. I want to take it on some winding roads. Sorry, I just get out of that sun. We'll take it on some winding roads uh, and see how it handles. It is good that you can raise and lower the suspension. Um, it does lay it lower quite low, uh, but it won't let you drive on the absolute lowest setting because it's just basically, it feels like it's on the bump stops, but it helps you know provide easy access getting in and out. And then we'll go, we'll go on the highway and we'll also do some off-roading. I'm not gonna to go too crazy. I don't wanna scratch those big 22 inch wheels, but we'll, we'll take it off-road. I know these are capable and you probably know they're capable as well. It's just like a Land Cruiser basically. The main drawback is probably the, the wheels and the tires. They're not super off-road capable. And the fact that it's got a bit of a, a lower front bumper bar, I guess, an approach angle would be impacted by that. You don't wanna scratch that little lip spoiler going on there. First things first, zero to 100. I've got the V-Box connected up to the sunroof there. I've got stability and traction control turned completely off and I've got it in Sport Plus or Sport S Plus mode. In my experience testing vehicles, Sport mode isn't always quickest. It just changes throttle response. So it feels quicker when you just push a little bit of throttle, like you don't need to move the pedal that much to get a response from the engine. But full throttle is full throttle, it doesn't matter. The butterfly in the engine is fully open uh, regardless of the mode, in most cases anyway. And I actually find that sometimes in particularly SUVs like this or proper four wheel drives, sport mode is slower than the normal mode because it, it causes, causes the engine or it lets the engine rev right out 
And vehicles like this that have, you know, very tall or very uh, short ratio gearboxes and differentials and things, they don't need to rev or they don't like to rev so high. Uh, and it's better off just going through the gears a bit quicker, a bit lower in the rev range, and you actually build speed quicker. But anyway, we'll try it in Sport Plus, uh, Sport S Plus, and I'll do a run in normal mode just to show you the difference anyway. It feels quick, it feels very responsive and it sort of pounces off the line, especially when you build the engine revs on the brake a little bit. But that looks like it's done 6.5 seconds. Six point five two seconds. So I'll do it again, and this time I'll leave it in normal mode. Okay, same spot, more or less. It's not a perfectly flat road, so don't take the time too seriously. I'm just giving you a bit of an idea. We'll flick it back over into normal mode. Hit start. So this won't time until the the vehicle starts moving. That looks like it's done 6.4 this time. So 6.37 with normal mode. That's just something worth keeping in mind anyway. Sport mode doesn't automatically mean, you know, absolute performance, more power. In some cars it does. It does actually unlock more power. Supercars and some EVs and things that will actually, yeah, make the car quicker. But in normal cases, like normal SUVs and hatchbacks and things, it mainly concentrates, sport mode mainly concentrates on increasing throttle sensitivity. So you don't, don't need to put, move your foot much to achieve acceleration. Certainly good if you're overtaking and things because, you know, you only need to move your foot halfway and you'll get around someone rather than full throttle. But full throttle is still full throttle regardless of the mode in most cases. We'll put it back into Sport Plus S mode for the handling test. Obviously this is not a sports car so we can't expect too much from it in terms of absolute cornering enjoyment but it does feel pretty good. This is based on the TNGA F platform as I said and it's a it's a decent platform. It is the largest version of the platform or I think the second largest maybe compared with those big American trucks and so on. But it is expected to underpin the next gen Toyota Hilux as well. It'll be a, a sort of smaller version, but it's a pretty advanced platform and it's it handles quite well for what it is. Live axle rear suspension still, so you've got that heavy, uh, heavy duty off-road capability and for, good for towing, but then you've got independent front end to help with comfort and steering agility. The steering does feel quite nice actually for a big vehicle like this. I can feel what's going on right down to the tires and I can kind of feel where the tires are on the road, which is you know, not something you normally get from a huge SUV like this, especially a rugged style one. It's pretty easy to keep in the lane in that respect because you know where everything is. The ride comfort is, you can feel this is a little bit stiff in the Sport Plus or Sport S Plus mode, but it is managing body roll quite well. It doesn't feel like a big, you know, cumbersome pig coming through here. It does feel quite agile, again, for what it is. I really like this engine. It's very smooth and linear. It picks up from low RPM. The 10-speed auto does hunt around a little bit and it kind of, kind of feels like a CVT in some ways just because it's constantly moving around the rev range. But it will hold gears okay, especially in the sport mode. And top end power, I'll just give it four beans. Yeah, it's got like a bit of an inline six kind of sound to it, a little bit. Just got a bit more raspiness with the V6. But yeah, it feels good. It definitely feels like a nice engine. Do I miss a V8? I don't think so. It's got this refinement, added extra level of refinement, being a V6 twin turbo, in my opinion. It's uh, got a bit more of a bassy note to it, although the V8 was pretty bassy too, I guess. But there's no burbling, it's just quite smooth. So in that respect, it is more in sync with a luxury cruising type of character. It just has, doesn't have that empowering bellow in the background as you're cruising along. 
but you know Lexus pretty much had no choice it has to reduce its emissions like everybody so they've got to turn to smaller capacity turbocharging and get rid of the V8s unfortunately I just pulled over and I've noticed something on this little graphic so when you have the steering wheel turned it does actually turn on the little display there which is quite cool because you, at least you know you know you might not know you might have the steering wheel sitting like that with the you know in the typical straight ahead position but the wheels actually might be locked like this sitting like this and you're about to hit the accelerator and whoa the, the steering is actually turned the engine sound isn't very entertaining I'd actually like to hear this with an aftermarket exhaust just to see what it really sounds like um, but it definitely suits the, the sort of comfortable nature of the car I guess the, ta the main takeaway of driving on a road like this is in terms of the handling it's not completely out of its comfort zone you wouldn't avoid a road like this uh, just because it's a heavy duty SUV in other words which is not something that could be said of a lot of heavy duty SUVs that are meant for you know off-roading speaking of which let's head out to the off-road section now and see how it performs on this corrugated dirt road it's doing really well it's not vibrating or bouncing around and I've still got full steering control some vehicles will skip along the top of the corrugations and you'll lose a bit of that feeling in the steering but this is remaining very planted and secure as you'd expect it is a big heavy vehicle too comfort is good as well I'm not feeling the the harshness of the road too much I've just got it in the normal mode still we can raise the suspension up a bit when we get to the more difficult sections up here I guess that's what puts this ahead of you know a common dual cab ute or something like that if you're touring Australia or planning to tour Australia you're going to encounter roads like this quite a lot in remote sections and it's good to know that this is this remains comfortable so you're not going to get fatigued as quickly as you will in some of those dual cab utes but I guess that's what you'd expect this is a lot more expensive this is priced from around $170,000 compared with a you know dual cab ute might be 70 or 80,000 okay we'll do this little loop again this is what I usually do when we do four wheel drive tests down this way and there's a few little bumps and little mud mud pits and so on and we'll come back out here and there's another little mud pit up the up there you can just see I'll raise the suspension you've got h1 and h2 I might as well raise it up to h2 usually I just put it in neutral and leave the handbrake off and just let it roll a little bit just so it can pivot its way up to the highest setting without you know the brakes kind of holding it down a little bit but you don't have to you can do this on the go if you want to and in the the low setting it does drive I said before that you can't drive in low you can drive in low but only at car park speeds as soon as you get up to a certain speed like 20 or 30 kilometers an hour it'll start raising back up to the normal uh, height setting okay, there's a little jump down here that I've been going over in a lot of the different utes and 4x4s so I'll see how this goes I'm not expecting it to be really tied down because it does you know concentrate on comfort as well it's not com complete heavy duty but we'll see how it goes at this speed yeah that's pretty good it didn't bounce or bottom out or anything I went over that in the GWM ute the Canon and at that speed and it actually bottomed out the front end pretty quickly I'm not trying to compare this to a cheap ute but it's just I think it's worth knowing you know when you spend more you do actually get more it's not just the same thing um, and I'm not saying that everybody goes off jumps but you know you, you encounter these things when you're in the outback and so on and there's a sudden a dip in the road that you didn't see yeah so that handled really well it didn't dive right down or absorb the impact too much too quickly we'll try that a bit faster actually because I am interested to see how the suspension goes when it's really taking in harder impacts some ruts and things through here that you probably can't see on camera but it drove smoothly over those so this is about 10 kilometers an hour faster yeah very nice it didn't dip right down it didn't even get close to bottoming out all right we'll do it once more a little bit quicker again <laughs> i want to see if i can get the air with this beast that 
another 10 kilometers an hour faster roughly beautiful that didn't do anything i don't even think the wheels came off the ground yeah really nice the suspension is definitely progressive in that it as it the suspension the wheel stroke moves up it starts to slow it down a lot whereas again yeah some vehicles uh, such as that GWM Canon Utes I don't mean to single that out I just remember that very vividly the suspension seemed to have a, a, a linear stroke in that when the wheel is moving it just keeps moving at the same rate or that's what it felt like anyway and it just hit the hit the bump stop straight away whereas this will slow the progression of progression of the uh, the wheel travel all right let's continue on first little bog hole these are quite deep it might not look like it on camera but you can feel the wheels going right down into it no sign of any kind of scrubbing or anything like that you do have 308 millimeters of ground clearance when you're in the highest setting like this which is it's huge that's a it's a big ground clearance um, measurement even compared with some of the more heavy duty style uh, off-road utes this does have a pretty long wheelbase so you do have to keep that in mind uh, you do need more clearance you know the longer the vehicle you need more clearance getting over mounds and so on but yeah 308 millimeters is still a lot now through this section I've still got stability and everything switched on no problem at all getting through that The Lexus LX, like the Land Cruiser, does have full-time four-wheel drive, so there's no sort of rear-wheel drive mode. You've just got the high and low range, but we won't need that on what I'm doing today. We'll go down here, and there's a bit of a steep uphill section, and we'll go back down and test out the hill descent control as well. But yeah, again, this is very comfortable. It's not, it doesn't feel like I'm in some rugged, you know, farm truck it, it feels like a comfortable SUV it just happens to be driving in rough terrain it's it's really yeah I guess that's the amazing part of a luxury off-roader that it can kind of do both although those low profile tires are obviously going to be the first limitation when you get pretty serious off-road Lexus does offer 20 inch wheels on some models with higher profile tires which you might like to option for if you are planning to do a lot of off-roading so i'm just keeping the throttle nice and steady trying to and this is yeah again pretty steep it might not look like it but you can kind of see the trees are on a bit of a an angle there but it's hard to convey the uh the actual steepness on camera but like you kind of struggle to walk up this especially in the wet going up with no problem whatsoever I really admire the Land Cruiser I know this gets a lot of lot of flack because it's expensive and all that and it's it is overpriced in my opinion because they, they would have paid off you know all the development of the vehicle especially that 70 series like that that should be a 40 grand car really because it's using the same tooling and the same production methods from decades literally decades ago so why does it cost 80 grand but you know for that you are getting a, a, a high level of peace of mind that you can get through rough stuff like this very easily and you're unlikely to break anything uh, although this is a pretty big vehicle so you, you might start to put some pinstripes down the sides if you're on pretty narrow tracks or overgrown tracks just something worth keeping in mind okay we've got another little boggy section through here and i put the wheels inside the tracks and being such a big vehicle We'll see if it touches the diff. These wide wheels might not even fit through this track. I won't fight against it. I'll just let the, the wheels turn where they want to turn. No, nope, didn't touch any of the, the underbody at all. I didn't hear anything or feel anything. Just drove straight through with no problem whatsoever. Back down the hill now. 
I put it into sort of the worst line there is. Again, it's not that serious, but you know, you couldn't take a normal hatchback or something down here. We'll just hit this crawl button here and it will give us downhill assist. Basically, that's no feet on the pedals and it's managing the stability completely. If I want to slow it down some more, just apply a bit more brake and it will just ease it down. So complete control and maximum grip and stability. So it won't slide sideways or anything like that. It'll just maintain stability the whole way down, even though it is pretty slippery. And when you're finished, you can just apply the throttle and away you go. But if you do leave it on, if I take off the throttle now, it'll pretty much slow the vehicle with stability control and everything. You have to actually turn it off if you want to just drive smoothly again, which is fair enough. It's just one button. There we have it, the Lexus LX600. About the only limitation off-road are the low-profile tyres compared with the Land Cruiser. And about the only downside to the vehicle overall is the price. But it's like an expensive mansion. If you can't afford it, then you just kind of can't afford it. But in this case, I think they are charging a bit too much for what it is. Um, it just in general, and a lot of new vehicles on, on the market in Australia are overpriced in my opinion. But if you can afford this, I think it's a great all-round tourer. You could go around the country in this and be comfortable and know that you've got the capability there. It cruises really nicely on the highway too, very low revs. Fuel consumption is pretty high. I'd probably consider the, the 500D diesel um, just because the consumption is a bit lower. Uh, and the performance is actually not that different. I've timed 0 to 100 in about a second slower, I think, uh, with the diesel. So you're not missing out on too much in terms of performance. But this engine is silky smooth. It sounds better than the diesel. Um, and you've got just that little bit more performance. And just knowing that you've got the LX600 badge, like that sounds pretty cool, right? I get the feeling vehicles like this aren't going to last much longer uh, with ever increasing emission standards. So the next version will definitely be a hybrid only at least and then eventually probably electric or I know Toyota is toying around with hydrogen systems including hydrogen combustion so it's a combustion engine that runs on hydrogen that sounds pretty interesting but yeah we'll just have to wait and see let me know what you think in the comments have I missed something and stay tuned for our written review on the website coming soon thanks for watching